All right, guys, I'm trying something a little bit different here. Uh, rather than doing um, like a voiced over PowerPoint file, what I'm actually doing is using my iPad and I'm recording um, my presentation here. The reason I'm doing that is because using the voiced over PowerPoint, it just it doesn't work very well to write on the slides like I'm so used to. This method seems to be a little bit better. Um, I don't have a video option, but that's okay. I think we can all survive without seeing my face. So this is um, our next part of this gas laws unit. And what we're going to be talking about today has to do with ideal gases, what does vapor pressure mean, and what are phase diagrams. So to get started, I want to talk about something called the kinetic molecular theory. Sometimes you'll see it abbreviated KMT. And it has four parts. And essentially what it does is give you uh, descriptors for what is considered an ideal gas. And we've seen that term before. If you'll remember, we've looked at the ideal gas law. So if you think about what the word ideal means, in everyday life, the word ideal means like perfect. So what does it mean to be a perfect gas? Well, first of all, within a gas that is ideal, the volume of the individual gas particles would be almost zero, meaning their volume is incredibly, incredibly small. Another characteristic is that, and, and we've talked about this before, that every time a gas particle strikes the side of its container, it exerts a force, um, which is the definition of pressure. An ideal gas, the particles do not exert forces on each other. Um, if we were in a physics class, I would say these are perfectly elastic can, uh, elastic collisions. So when one gas particle hits another, they don't exert forces on each other. Real gases do exert small forces on each other, but in a perfect gas that wouldn't be happening. And then the last part isn't really necessarily a characteristic, it's just something to keep in mind, that the temperature of a gas and, and there's, a little, um, there's a little symbol here. That symbol right there means is proportional to. So the temperature of a gas is proportional to the average kinetic energy of that gas. Kinetic energy, if you'll recall, is the energy of motion and movement. Okay, so these are the characteristics of a perfect gas. Okay. An ideal gas is a hypothetical substance, okay? It, it's, it's, the, it's the ideal. So think of it as a limit. A real gas can approach ideal behavior but never quite reach it. It's kind of like in math, you talk about asymptotes. You know, your graph can approach the asymptote but will never actually reach it. So what's the best, what are the best conditions we can get to make a real gas ideal? The best conditions we can get are at very low pressures and very high temperatures. And there's just this silly little way to remember that, that relationship or those conditions. If you can remember hot lips, you know, high temperature, low pressure, those are the most ideal conditions. If you have a real gas, that's the best you can get. That's the closest you can get a gas to approach ideal behavior. So even though real gases are not ideal, we're going to use things like the ideal gas law because it's close enough for our purposes. So let's get into what does the term vapor pressure mean. 
And before we can talk about that, we need to understand the, con the concept of what is going on in a closed vial, you know, like a closed flask, like what's in this picture. If you have a liquid in a closed flask, what's really going on in there? So let's review. The word vaporization means the process of a liquid changing into a gas. If you will recall, the opposite direction, the opposite process is called condensation. Okay. If you have a closed system with a liquid, there will be vapor particles in the space above it, just like we're seeing in this picture right here. Okay. Now, eventually, the rate at which gas, or excuse me, the rate at which the liquid particles are changing into gaseous particles and vice versa, those rates will eventually be equal. And that's what we call being at equilibrium. Okay, so if you have a water bottle sitting out on your counter, even just at room temperature, that water bottle is at equilibrium. For every liquid water particle that converts into water vapor, one particle of water vapor will convert back into liquid form. That's at equilibrium. Okay, now, once you have equilibrium established, that vapor that is above that liquid has a pressure. And that's all vapor pressure is, is just the pressure of the, ga of the gas that is above a liquid. What determines how much pr vapor pressure a vapor has is honestly determined by the strength of the intermolecular forces of the liquid. Now, that's a term we haven't used in a long time, intermolecular forces. If you guys will remember, that's things like London dispersion forces, dipole-dipole attraction, hydrogen bonding, those things. And guys, if you think about it, if two liquid particles are held together very tightly through strong intermolecular forces, how likely is it that those liquid particles will be pulled apart and turned into vapor? Not very likely because those liquid particles are held so tightly together. So if you think about it, as the strength of the intermolecular force between two liquid particles, as those forces get stronger, there will simply be less vapor above it. If there's less vapor, there will be less vapor pressure. Okay, so the stronger the intermolecular forces in the liquid, the lower the vapor pressure will be above it, simply because there just isn't as much vapor there. Okay, now there's a relationship here with temperature, which actually I'm going to come back to in just a second. Okay. Um, let me highlight this word for you right here. This is a good vocabulary word that you should know, volatile. Okay, if a person is described as having a volatile personality, this is a person that's very reactive, maybe they have a short temper, um, you know, explosive personality. Well, volatile liquids... If you read this, this definition here, it says volatile liquids have high vapor pressures. So think about what that means. What kinds of liquids have high vapor pressures? If you look at this relationship right here, those must be liquids that have fairly weak intermolecular forces, and they do. So these are liquids that vaporize, evaporate very, very easily. Think about things in your everyday life. You know, you go to the doctor's office to get your flu shot and the nurse uh, rubs a little alcohol on your arm before giving you the injection. Alcohol is a volatile liquid. It evaporates very quickly. 
Um, those of you that regularly paint your nails, nail polish remover is primarily acetone. Acetone evaporates very quickly. It's also very volatile. Um, volatile liquids can be dangerous because they tend to be very flammable and sometimes even explosive. So we have to keep them in a special cabinet in our chemical storeroom. Okay, but I want you to know that vocabulary word, volatile. So let's talk about temperature, okay? You have a graph in your notes uh, that looks very similar to this one. Doesn't matter which one you look at. So if you look at the x-axis, temperature is on the x, vapor pressure in millimeters of mercury is on the y. Now it does not matter which line you look at, do you notice that for all of them, as temperature goes up, vapor pressure also goes up? And guys, that should make sense to you. Okay, if you increase the temperature of any liquid, it doesn't matter what it is, what happens to those particles? They move faster, they have more energy. Think about it. If these liquid particles are, able, are moving around faster, they have more energy, are they more likely to pull apart from each other? And the answer is yes. And that's what's required to turn liquid into gas. So if you're going to be able to create more gas, because it's hotter, then you're going to get a greater vapor pressure. Now, I want you to notice that in the diet, this graph that's on the slide in front of you, there's a special place marked out on the y-axis, 760 millimeters of mercury. That's a number that should be kind of ringing a bell in the back of your head. That is standard pressure, okay? Like STP, standard temperature and pressure, 760 millimeters of mercury is, a, is standard pressure. Pressure. So where that dashed line is hitting each one of the, the red line, the green line, the blue line, those are what are called normal boiling points. Okay, so if you ever see the word normal anywhere in this kind of circumstance, normal just means at standard pressure. Okay, standard pressure, if it was in atmospheres, that would be one atm. If it's in millimeters of mercury, that's 760. So at standard pressure, I'm looking at the one, the graph on the slide, ether, that's a liquid, ether boils at 34.6 degrees Celsius. Ethyl alcohol boils at 78.3 degrees Celsius. And look at water. We know water's boiling point to be 100 degrees. Well, that's true as long as we're at normal standard pressure. Okay, so technically speaking, if we went up to Mount Everest, let's say, okay, where the pressure is much, much lower, Okay, I don't know how much lower, let's say, let's say the pressure on Everest is 600 millimeters of mercury. If you follow that across, water doesn't boil at 100 degrees. Water boils at, I'm just following this down, I don't know, maybe like 90, 92 degrees. Okay, it boils at a much lower temperature. So when we say, oh yeah, yeah, water boils at 100 degrees, that's always assu assuming standard pressure. Okay, just wanted to make sure that that was clear. So if you ever see the word normal, normal just means standard pressure. So a piece of equipment that you can use to measure vapor pressure is a piece of equipment called a manometer, okay? It's not pronounced manometer. I've heard people pronounce it that way. It's a manometer, okay? So in this drawing, we've got two liquids, and this right here, these are 
columns of mercury within that glass tube. And if you can see, the liquid A is pushing the mercury column lower than the liquid B is. Liquid A's gas, the vapor above the, its liquid, is exerting a greater pressure than liquids, liquid B is, okay? So if I gave you these two pictures and I said, which liquid has a greater vapor pressure? You would say liquid A, because I can see that it's pushing that mercury column more than liquid B is. Okay, so turn the page in your notes. This is the last part. Um, these graphs, these are called phase diagrams. Okay, you have temperature on the x-axis, you have pressure on the y, this time pressure is in atmospheres. And what this is, is basically you can give any temperature and pressure combination you want and where those coordinates land will determine whether that substance is a solid, a liquid, or a gas. Okay, so if you gave me a pressure of, I don't know, somewhere like right there and a temperature right there, I would bring these two pieces together and that would land me like right there. So I would know that this substance at that temperature and that pressure combination, it's a liquid. Okay. A um, couple of things to take note of. This point right in the middle, okay, where all three phases meet, that's called the triple point. That means, I mean, let's just use water if you like. All Solid, liquid, and gas are existing all at the same time. Imagine a glass of ice water, right, because that would have liquid and solid both at the same time. So a glass of ice water that also has steam coming out of it. <laughs> That's what that would look like, as strange as that is. Okay, uh, let me change color here. So everything along this border here, that would be all different melting points if you're going in that direction, or if you're thinking about it from this direction, all the different freezing points. Okay, everything along this border, these are different boiling points looking that way and different condensation points going that way. All right, let's see what you guys remember. This is between solid and gas. Do you remember the term that means to go from solid to gas? The word is sublimation. Gas to solid, that's the one no one ever remembers. That's deposition. Okay. Now, let me erase all of that. Okay. Now, here is, let me change color again. Here's standard pressure, one atmosphere. If you follow this dashed line across to where it hits that solid to liquid boundary and bring it down, zero degrees Celsius is the normal melting point of water. So this is the phase diagram for water. If you follow this one atmosphere line across to this point and bring it down, that's the normal boiling point of water, okay? Um, you'll notice that at one atmosphere, that dashed line for one atmosphere does not ever cross the solid to gas boundary. It doesn't ever have a chance to cross that boundary. That's because ice doesn't sublime at standard pressure. Okay, so you're not going to be asked to draw these diagrams. Rather, you'd be asked simply to interpret them, you know, to be given one and to answer questions about it. So 
There's this one, and then in your notes, look at the diagram just below it. It's the same one I have here. And look at the difference. I'm just gonna sort of flip back and forth here. What's the main difference that you notice? They both have solid liquid and gas areas. They both have a triple point. What I'm hoping you notice is this line right here, okay? On the graph at the top of your page, that line has a negative slope. This one in front of us clearly has a positive slope, okay? I will tell you guys right now that most substances on Earth have diagrams that look like the one right in front of us right now. They have that solid to liquid boundary with a positive slope. However, the one that we looked at just a minute ago with the negative slope, this is the phase diagram for water. And water is unusual because it has that negative slope boundary. And the reason it has that is because, and this is why water is kind of unique amongst substances, its solid form is less dense than its liquid form. That's unusual. Most substances, their solid form is more dense. Think about ice water. Ice floats in water. That is unusual. Most substances, their solid form will sink in their liquid form. But water is a little unusual. So when you see this negative slope between solid and liquid, that's unusual. That means that the solid is less dense than the liquid. But as I said, most phase diagrams look like this one. So um, this is our last slide here. If you were given a blank phase diagram like, like this one, let's just kind of make sure that we've got this. So this whole region is all this entire area. That's all solid. Okay, this region is liquid, this region is gas. SLG, silly little girl. Okay, here's your triple point right in the middle. Okay, this whole boundary, and let's see if I can highlight it. Those are all your different melting points. Here are all your different boiling points. These are all different sublimation points. Okay, if you were asked to label the normal melting and boiling points, okay, well, here's standard pressure in atmospheres. So I'm gonna take this and I'm gonna follow it across. So that would be the normal melting point forgive my drawing here, and that would be the approximate normal boiling point. This substance does not have a normal sublimation point. It never, never crosses that boundary at standard pressure. Okay, uh, the only other question I can imagine you being asked for something like this would be, um, based on this diagram, does the solid form, is the solid form more or less dense than the liquid? Based on the fact that this phase diagram has a positive slope between solid and liquid, I would say that the solid form is more dense than the liquid. So that is the end of today's lesson. Okay, you can now do the homework questions and check your answers. And I look forward to our next lesson. I hope you guys are doing well and you're not going crazy with boredom. So um, drop me an email if you ever just feel like, you know, saying hello. Anyway, I will look forward to our next lesson. Bye, y'all.